All right, so solvation is going to be the mixing of this solute with the solvent. If we are using water, then that's called hydration. The attraction between the dipoles of the water molecule and the ions of the crystal are greater than those of the crystal. And we talked about this, um, I think we talked about this a while back, how if you have like, for example, sodium chloride, okay, when it's in its solid form, so in your salt shaker, for example, it's going to be looking like this, where you've got these alternating positive and negative charges, okay? If I have that and then I have a glass of water over here, that water is going to have some attraction between the oxygen and the hydrogen. These poles, they're going to have an attraction between them, okay? When I mix these, so I dump some of that salt into here, what they're saying is that the attraction between the water and the pot, so the oxygen end of this and the positive here, that attraction is going to be greater than the attraction between the two waters or the attraction between the chlorine and the sodium here. And it's essentially going to pull this apart and you're going to surround these ions with water molecules. So if you've got a sodium here, that sodium is positively charged. The negative end of that water is going to get attracted to that sodium. And it's going to surround it. And I don't know how many waters it's going to be. I'm just going to draw four on here. It may be more than that. I have no earthly idea. But that's the idea behind it. The negative pull of that water, and remember that the oxygen is negative. That's where your lone pairs of electrons are. That negative end of the water is going to get attracted to the positive ion. And it's going to pull this apart until this is completely pulled out apart into pieces. Okay, one of two things will happen. Either you're going to run out of these for water to surround, or you're going to run out of water to be able to surround these. Okay, so <clears throat> when this happens, in order to pull this apart, it takes energy. In order to pull this apart, it takes energy. And then when they come together, it's going to release energy. And I kind of think of it like two magnets, right? If I had two magnets and I was trying to get them to separate, I would have to put some physical energy into that to get those magnets pulled apart, wouldn't I? Okay. But when those magnets come together... They just pop. And I don't need to exert any energy in that. They, it just happens. Okay? That's going to release some energy into the world. Okay? If this process requires more energy than this process, <clears throat> then it's going to be an endothermic reaction. You're going to have to input endothermic, you're going to have to input more energy in <coughs> than would be released. <coughs> and this would actually feel cool to the touch because that energy is coming from the surrounding area in the form of heat. <coughs> if the opposite is true, if you're inputting less energy than you're getting out, then this will feel warm. And if you remember, when I mixed that alcohol and water together, I brought it around and I told you to feel it, didn't I? And I said, I'm going to come back to that. That's what I'm coming back to. That actually released more energy in this process than it had to have input. So it felt warm when the alcohol and water mixed together. That was an exothermic change. Because heat is being released into the surroundings and you're feeling that with your hand. <clears throat> when we go through and we mix acids and bases, when we dilute those down, 
So I was, I was telling you about how most of my acids come in at a high molarity and I have to dilute it down. It is very exothermic. So for certain ones, especially like my sulfuric acid that's really concentrated, I actually have to have an ice bath when I do it because it, it generates so much energy that it can actually crack the glassware. So you have to be very careful when you're diluting those down, okay? So that overall heat energy exchange then is called heat of solution. Now, there are things that can affect this solvation, okay? And I'm going to switch over to my other thing of notes so I can start drawing on here a little more, okay? So things that are going to affect um, solvation, and you do this in your kitchen, okay? So um, agitation. So when you cook, how do you agitate things? Well, you stir them or you shake them. Okay, when you have um, salad dressing that separates out, what do you do before you serve it? Or, you know, you shake it. Um, orange juice with pulp in it, okay? You're going to shake that and make sure everything gets, and that's going to affect it. That would increase the solvation rate. You can increase the surface area. And you can do that by breaking it up into smaller pieces. Back, please excuse this interruption. If you are a junior, you need to report to the large auditorium to attend the job fair. Any juniors remaining in your class, please report to the large auditor auditorium to attend the job fair. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. So we're going to increase the surface area. And um, like, for example, if you went home and you wanted to um, get something to mix together with sugar, you've probably got a couple of different types of sugar in your kitchen. You have granulated sugar, which is probably in a canister on your countertop possibly. And then you have something called powdered sugar, right? It's the same sugar. It's the same thing, same chemical <clears throat> makeup of those two sugars. The difference is, is that powdered sugar has been ground finer. You may also have something called popcorn salt in your pantry. Okay. Popcorn salt is just salt like you put in your salt shaker, but it's ground finer. So you can get little finer amounts on your popcorn. <clears throat> they have changed the surface area of that. And then temperature is the next one. Now, with temperature, most solid solutes, as the temperature increases, the rate of solvation is going to increase. So if you heat up that substance, you're going to be able to get more of that solid in. So if you wanted, for example, really sweet Kool-Aid, you could take the water that's going into your Kool-Aid and you could get it to boiling. You could add a bunch of sugar in there, a lot more than would normally call for, okay? And then you could cool it down and you're going to be able to get more sugar dissolved in that liquid. That's how the Southerners make our tea. Okay. We heat up the water, we boil the water, we steep the tea leaves. While the thing's still warm, we add our sugar into that or sweetener, whatever you use. And that's how we make our tea. Depending on who taught you how to make tea, it can get really, really sweet. Now, I know uh, for some of you that are purists when it comes to tea, like we just complete, and yeah, I know, I know what we do to it. I get it, but it's how we were raised. So, you know, tea in our baby bottles. Y'all got milk. We got tea, sweet tea. All right. Most gas solutes though, as temperature decreases, the rate of solvation increases. Now, this is probably something that y'all haven't thought about as much, okay? 
So when your fish, so you've got your fish swimming around in the water. Do you like my drawing of my fish here? Okay. They're swimming around. They've got their little gill slits here. Okay. How do they get oxygen? What do they do? Yeah. How is it in the water? What do they do with the water? They break that water up so that they've got oxygen and hydrogen. They go through like some sort of chemical reaction to get this oxygen out of there. No, no. That water has oxygen molecules dissolved in it. So in between these water molecules, you've got oxygen that's dissolved in that water. Okay. And that's what the fish bring in and use. Just like in the air here, we have oxygen dissolved and we bring that in and we breathe with that. Okay. So <clears throat> that's the way the fish work. Now, the colder it is, the more of this oxygen they can end up having dissolved in that water. And you will get different species of fish depending on what the temperature of that water is. So your really cold climates, your mountain climates, that sort of thing, you're going to get real good trout, walleye, stuff like that. Those fish would not survive in other areas because there would not be enough oxygen dissolved in the water. So certain species of fish require more dissolved oxygen than other ones. If this water gets too hot, then you don't have any oxygen left and the fish die. Okay. And you'll see that during the summer, sometimes when it gets really hot, the fish go belly up because they don't have enough oxygen dissolved in the water anymore. Or if an industrial plant like releases a whole bunch of really hot water into a lake, you'll have a fish kill because the, the fish don't have enough dissolved oxygen in there to survive. Okay. <clears throat> Solubility also depends on the nature of that solute. Okay. <clears throat> so like I was saying before with my previous drawing that I had on my other notes there, you can have a situation where you run out of solute and you've got extra water left behind. That would be a unsaturated solution. You could add more solute in and get it to dissolve. If you've run out of water molecules and you have extra solute left, that's called a saturated solution. You can't add any more solute in. If you do, what happens to it? Yeah, and it's just going to sink to the bottom because it's generally more dense than the water. All right. Solubility is affected by increasing the temperature of a solvent because of kinetic energy of the particles. What was I trying? Hmm? What did I want you to Ah, increases. So because that increases, increasing the temperature of the solvent will cause it, and then that's going to increase the solubility. Okay. So a super saturated solution, and I was going to try to get you guys mixed one of those up, and I forgot to do it. That was something that I was going to... Um, get done and I forgot to do that too. Sorry. You can look those up though. But these super saturated solutions are going to contain more solute than they should. They are highly unstable though. Okay. I'll see if I can find a video online in just a second with that. <clears throat> Let's pop over and see if we can find one of those. Ha <laughs> ha 
<clears throat> All right, so here is a super saturated solution. You can see, my guess is it's probably sodium acetate. That's what most people use. And you, yep, sodium acetate. Um, so what you do is you add, you heat this up and you keep adding sodium acetate and sodium acetate, way more than it should have. But at the higher temperature, it's gonna dissolve more in there. And then over time, you can let it sit and cool. You can add what's called a seed crystal in and then watch what's gonna happen with this guy when they add that seed crystal in. Yeah, and I mean, this is just, this is like real time. And it's going to end up being a solid then inside there. So it comes out of solution. And it actually would feel warm at this point as well. It would release a lot of heat energy. So that's what it ends up looking like. And I meant to get one of those mixed up for you guys so you could see it in person, but it's kind of cool to to watch. Um, all right, where am I at with my notes? Here we go. All right, the last thing that I want to talk about is something called Henry's Law. And <clears throat> Henry's Law involves gases that are dissolved in liquid solvents. Okay, so the solubility of a gas, what did I want to do there for that? Which way did I want to phrase that? Decreases as its pressure is reduced. Okay. And this, if we think about the idea behind this concept and behind the temperature and think about pop. Okay. If you think about pop, pop is created. You've got some, you've got mostly water, right? So that's your solvent. And then you also have like sugar in there and some flavoring. Those are both solutes. Typically, a lot of times they are going to be solids, but they're going to be dissolved in there. Okay. And you also have what? What makes it pop? What makes it fizz, Eric? Yeah. So carbon dioxide is dissolved in there and that's a gas. Okay. So that's also going to be dissolved in and that's what makes it pop and fizz. Okay. Is actually that carbon dioxide coming out of solution. So when your pop is fizzing, you're losing carbon dioxide. Now, when you open up that container, originally from the factory, what do you experience? Fizzing? Well, initially though, I mean, the first time when you crack that thing open, what do you hear? Air. Right. And that is changing pressure. Your pop from the factory is put under pressure and they increase the pressure of it so that they can, um, so if their pressure is increased, that is going to increase the solubility. So it's going to get more carbon dioxide dissolved in there than would be at room temperature or room pressure. Okay. Those things are under pressure. That's why if you hit the can, it, because it's, it's releasing that pressure out into the world. Okay. And it's equalizing those pressures. But they, they put it under pressure so that they can get more of that CO2 to dissolve. You also typically have your pop cold, right? Colder pop will have more CO2 dissolved in it than warm pop. Because up here, we said that for gas solutes, if you decrease the temperature, you increase the solvation. So more gas is going to dissolve in pop that's cold and that is under pressure. You also have a gas in your joint space. 
okay? Inside your joints here, you've got something called synovial fluid, okay? And there is a gas that is dissolved in there. Right now, as your fingers are in your hand, for example, they are under pressure between those joints coming together. If you reduce that pressure by expanding, so you're increasing the volume, increased volume does what to pressure? Reduces. Reduces pressure. If I reduce the pressure on my joint, that gas comes out of solution and you hear a pop. That is the pop that you hear when you have a joint that you have increased the volume of. So when you increase a joint volume, the gas comes out of solution and you hear the popping sound. Now, you let it sit there for a few minutes, it'll go back into solution and you can repeat. Now, I'm not telling you to go home and pop your joints because your parents might have told you not to. You deal with your parents however you, I'm just explaining to you what happens. I am also not coming down and saying that you will ruin your joints or you won't ruin your, I'm not. I'm not getting into that one. Okay, so there's my disclaimer. I'm just telling you what happens with your joints when that occurs. Okay, and we probably all popped our knuckles at some point. Okay, not that I'm telling you to do it. Don't want any email. None. Okay. You're also going to, in your homework tonight, read um, through some stuff about the bends, which is something that happens with scuba divers if they come up too quickly. So um, it's kind of an interesting uh, little read there, too. It's not long. There's not a lot of reading involved in this stuff, okay? Um, if you go over to classroom, I have a... Um, few <clears throat> articles that are attached or will be attached to today's post on there. I'll get those up um, very quickly for you. Um, so today is going to be 14.4. So these are the three pro um, readings that you have for your homework tonight and then i'll get the video posted on here in a little bit okay um so questions about anything <clears throat> all right then we will